Hello, everybody, and welcome to this, which is the third of our Culture Circle uh, conversations as part of Belong BM. Um, my name is Sarah Keen. I am Projects Coordinator with Access Ballymun, and I am Project Manager of the Belong BM project. Um, as you may know by now, if you've been joining our Culture Circle conversations, these are um, nice informal conversations every, uh, every Thursday lunchtime where we chat about books, about films, about things that people have been reading and uh, things that they would like to, to recommend to us all. Um, and I'm delighted to be joined. Uh, this, this week's session has been curated by Mother Tongues by Francesca Lamorgia of Mother Tongues. And I'm delighted to be joined by Francesca now to give us a sense of what is coming up in Mother Tongues Festival. Hello. Um, well, it's it's great to be here with friends and uh, also to discuss something that I'm quite passionate about, not only the festival, but also reading and books and films. Um, yeah, the festival is coming up and uh, it's in about four weeks time at this point. Uh, on Saturday, the 26th is the big, big uh, day, but we have a program throughout the week as well. So we will be in uh, Driocht. Uh, with workshops for children and then on the Saturday the 26th we'll have our big event in Tala, Rua Red, the Civic Theatre um, and there's so much that I couldn't even start by listing. Uh, we've given the program out to curators so I will be very surprised because I, I think at this point I know only what people can read on the website. Uh, the curators are going to be taking over rooms and uh, I suppose offering everyone an opportunity to try some dance moves, uh, maybe try out some Yoruba language. Um, hopefully, you know, if, then if you go into another room, you can try Chinese calligraphy. Uh, and then you go upstairs and there'll be Iranian theater. So there's plenty, there's a film program. And it's what's really important is that not only the festival is multilingual, uh, but what we really want to see is people bringing their own languages. Mm -hmm. So we have a big map uh, that we are compiling and it's called the map of nostalgia and we're inviting everybody to come in and share with us the memory of what they miss and where is this thing or this person or this object that they miss and really the festival is really very much about identity, about language, about who we are now that we live in Ireland and what, what does Ireland look like and you know it's inspiring for children. It's also very good fun for adults. So it's a festival where, you know, this year because of COVID, we re we had to rethink a little bit uh, how we were planning uh, the moving of people more so than anything else. And I think we've made a sound decision to have a kind of a one ticket. And this ticket allows you to go into any room at any given time in the day, uh, or at least we have a slot for the morning and a slot for the afternoon. So people can experience more and also just decide maybe I really love dancing and I want to stay there for two hours rather than having to drop out. So we'll see how it goes. It's an experiment, uh, but we're really happy that it's going to be a live festival because there hasn't been many of those lately. So absolutely. And I, I really love that idea of the, the map of nostalgia because it is such a powerful um, experience. Uh, nostalgia and it's something that I think we've all experienced in some way, shape or form and particularly over the past two years there's been a lot of things missed and uh, and people who we've been missing and, and events and, you know, significant life moments and all of those kind of things that feed into who we are and how we inter interact with the world. So I'm really excited uh, that there is a live festival. Um, and just, I suppose, for a plug for the, the uh, another part of the Belong VM project, you can also hear myself and Francesca talking about the Mother Tongues Festival um, in, in more scope as part of the podcast, um, which, and that, that episode actually will be going out next Tuesday. So um, if you tune into the podcast, you can get them on Spotify, you can get them on all the usual podcast uh, places, um, and you can find information on that on the Access Ballymun website. Um, and you can hear a little bit more about uh, Mother Tongues from Francesca there. But for now, if people are interested in going to a live festival in February, where can they find the information? The programme is on mothertonguesfestival.com. And it's also possible to call DREACT or call the Civic Theatre to book a ticket. Uh, so you can just go out, get it online or just contact the box office. And, Brilliant. Yeah. 
Yeah, sounds really exciting. Thank you so much for, for that, uh, Francesca. Um, so we're joined by uh, three artists, three people who have engaged with mother tongues or are due to engage with mother tongues in the past and in the future. Um, thank you all so much for being here. Uh, Gijo, I might come to you first. Hi, uh, my name is Gijo Sebastian. I'm a collaborative filmmaker. I've been here I'm originally from India, but I uh, was living in Ireland for the last 14 years. Uh, I have a list of films and I have two, two books. I don't know whether I'll be able to finish, uh, whether we will have enough time, but uh, I will go through them briefly anyway. Fantastic. Now, Thank you very much. Okay. Uh, uh, I don't know my list of films are uh, really accessible or watchable to a regular audience. But anyway, these are the kind of films I've been watching and the films I want, I want to use this opportunity to promote some films as well from non-English languages. So uh, some of them are old films. Uh, some of them are not available anywhere other than maybe on YouTube, very bad prints, but still these films are worth watching in my opinion. Here we go. The first film is called Vitean. Uh, it, it's a Malayalam language film. Uh, uh, it's, a la it's my mother tongue. I am from South India. My state is called Kerala. And there is a very renowned filmmaker from Kerala called Adul Govalagrishnan. Now, uh, at least for the first three films, I am promoting the directors. Mm -hmm. Not, uh, I, I, will be, I will be talking about one film, but uh, it's better to go into them. And you know, there are a lot of films available uh, which they made. Now, Adul Gobalagrishnan is, uh, a, I've been making films for the last 30 years or so. He's made about 12 films. Um, he is internationally renowned, internationally an acclaimed director, one of the acclaimed directors living in India at the moment. He, the film that I'm talking about won several awards, including an Pack Award at Rotterdam. And Adul himself has been honored by the Legion of Honor from the government from France, and he won Sutherland Trophy at London Film Festival. Actually, there is there is a, a, a center named after him in the University of Wisconsin in USA. So you get the picture. He's now uh, he's not more filmmaker. Now Vidayan is a film. is it, it, It's set in 1960s. It was released in 1994. It, it says the story of a master-slave relationship in a South Indian setting. This is something a, any viewer, and now I do, as, as you can infer from the honors he, he got, you know, he's an art house filmmaker, but this film is very relatable, very watchable for any audience, and you will get the feeling of what is South India like in the 1960s, and it is, it's a master-slave relationship, you know. It's it's a universal relationship anybody can uh, relate to. Now, my second film is uh, called Frost. Now, Aru's films are available on YouTube. Very good prints, full HD prints, restored, uh, and this film as well is available on YouTube. The next one is Frost. It's a Lithuanian film by a, a filmmaker by name Sharunas Bartas. It's available on movie at the moment. Now, again, a lot of his films are available on YouTube. Uh, the print quality is uh, very bad, but still, if you really want to go into it. But now this filmmaker is not very accessible to uh, regular, uh, regular viewers. Frost, the film available on movie is okay. It's an international police called drama film. It says about a story about two young uh, boyfriend and girlfriend driving a truck, a humanitarian aid truck to the front line in, in uh, Donbass in Ukraine. Now, the, the great, I like this filmmaker because of his style. It's very slow, very uh, earlier films has no dialogue at all or very sparse dialogue and very non-narrative. Uh, you get the picture. It's, it's, not, it's not very, it's not easy watching. It's not interesting watching, but I love his visuals, uh, his sense of imagery and his pacing and style is something which I, which I love. And another fact about this filmmaker is he, I, I watch his interviews and all, you know, during his interviews he says that you know, he doesn't see much of a difference between fiction and documentary, which is something I follow as well. M most of the films I make are, are fictionalized documentaries, especially this film Frost, 
uh, there is a scene in Frost towards the end where uh, uh, the the uh, the driver uh, or the protagonist is getting killed uh, about 100 meters from the front line of the war. And that scene was shot 200 meters from the front line of the war mm-hmm. in really. So it's almost a documentary like. Uh, all the film, a lot of films are available on YouTube. Uh, but again, the films rely on mood, atmosphere, and very close up of characters. You know, the typical avant-garde looking into the soul of the characters <laughs> to very close up that sort of stuff. Uh, but she is very renowned as well. Most of the films are premiered in, in, uh, in director's fortnight at Cannes Film, film Festival. Uh, a few of them were in competition in Cannes as well. So again, a big time director. The next film is called Red Moon Tide. I think I'm taking a lot of time. I'll just... No, please, fire away. Okay, it's very okay, interesting. Okay. And, and I'm sure nobody will have no questions because nobody would have seen any of these films. <laughs> anyway, but uh, this is an introduction. If, if at all you guys want to see something really, really out of... I mean, out there. Now, Red Moon Tide is different. It's a documentary. It's, a, it's a, from a relatively youngish and under 40 filmmaker. Uh, a Spanish filmmaker. It's a Spanish film. It's a documentary about a death in a fishing village of a man. Now, I love this film because of the style. You know, it is very stylized, it's very metaphorical, it's very poetic, surreal, flowing images. And if, if, if you ask me, this is the film which is very closest to me, which I would want to make. Like, you know, it is completely in alignment with my sense of image, sound, and the rhythm of cutting, you know, I, uh, and if, if you, if you, it is beautiful, well, to me, give it a try. Now I have some recommendations, but these are all very watchable films, these recommendations. Uh, I, I would start with uh, Good Favor by Rebecca Daly. Probably some of you might know Rebecca Daly, she is an Irish filmmaker. Mm, uh, she made this film in Belgium. If any of you have seen Another film which was made in Ireland by a Polish filmmaker called The Other Lamb. I don't know if you've seen that. And this is very much, uh, the setting is the same. You know, it, it's a Christian cult living in a forest. But uh, thematically, they are very different. This theme is very allegorical, biblical allegory uh, with a kind of messiah kind of imagery attributed to an immigrant. I love I loved it for its style, it's a slow rhythm and a kind of atmospheric ambience and a bit of the politics. Though towards the end, uh, I have a feeling that it, it was a bit overdone, but still a good film to watch. Another one, okay, I, I'm going for different languages here. Now, this is a Hindi language film. Hindi is the most uh, popular language in India, not the national language. Uh, let's take not because people think Hindi is the national language of India. Hindi is not. Um, and this this has a, a bit of a historical importance. And this is a commercial film. It's not my style, why it's not my kind, but uh, this is a film about uh, a man. It's called, the film is called Sardar Udam. He, uh, he, he go around as Udam Singh. He's a man who, He's a freedom fighter from Punjab, the state in India, who assassinated Michael O'Dwyer in London in 1919 as revenge for Jalin Malabag massacre or Amritsar massacre. It's called, I don't know if anybody has seen the movie Gandhi. There is a massacre scene in it. And, uh, about 1,500 people were killed by about 50 troops shooting, I mean, even including women and children, directly shooting at them in an enclosure. You know, I mean, they couldn't escape anywhere. The only exit was uh, where the troops were stationed and they just shot until the ammunition, they ran out of ammunition. And, and this man came over to London and uh, tracked Michael Lauder. Now there's a history for Michael Lauder. He's an Irish man. He's from Tipperary, but he's not, the, Irish man we love, you know, he's an anti-nationalist, he's a British loyalist. He uh, went on to uh, British army and then went up to the ranks and he was the governor general of Punjab. So there is some history, story, India and Ireland connected in there. And it's an interesting story. It's, uh, it's very well told uh, and on and on and on. 
Now, next one, the last one is a documentary again. This is a science documentary on space. Uh, uh, I don't know whether you heard everything and nothing. It's called. I think it's available on Prime Video or Netflix. I don't remember exactly. I liked it because it gave me some information which I didn't know, and especially because it really put my mind into a existential thought. I don't know that plane. You know, it kind of makes you feel so it's insignificant and small in this vast universe. You know, if you really want to feel like that, go watch that. That document. And I have two two books here. Oh no. Uh, th this is a book I recommend. Uh, this is not new, this is about 10 years old, but this book really changed my life or really, really changed my perception of the whole world. As you can see, it's a master of an imagery, The Divided Brain and the Making of the Western World. I'm very interested in how people think from different parts of the world, especially the, the dichotomies of East and West or Global North and Global South. And this book really explained to me why West is West the way and what makes the Western mind tick and why, because of the left hemisphere oriented thinking is its uh, argument. Uh, and if you're interested, that's a beautiful book. Now this one also around the same line, but it's a philosophical book. Uh, uh, by a philosopher who is arguing why different philosophies of the world is influencing the different cultures and hence maybe the culture war so whatever the clash of civilization all this happening because all the cultures are driven by the philosophies behind them it mainly deals with indian chinese and western traditions of philosophies but it was very interesting because it it and i haven't finished it but it it, it opens your mind to the basic and the basic uh, structure of uh, uh, how a person's mind takes, you know, because that's what's all coming from. I will stop there. I took too long. No, that was fantastic. And I, I have to say it, it always um, is really interesting to me when somebody from within an art form is giving rec recommendations from other work within that same art form, because um, you look at the work from a totally different perspective than somebody who is outside as an audience member watching a film. Uh, so that they are really fantastic recommendations and thank you for that. Um, I'm particularly struck by how, as you were speaking about the films, that the uh, a lot of it, a lot of the reason that it seems to pull you in is the kind of structural things, timing and space and editing and all of that, which I suppose we see, but maybe don't realize we see as an audience member. So um, that was a, a, a really great kind of insight into how a filmmaker thinks about film. So thank you very much for those. Um, Justine, I might come to you now uh, for, for a little introduction to yourself and also um, what you've, you've brought along as, as recommendations for us. Thanks, Soka, um, and thank you, Gijo, for that uh, recommendation. I think I'll try the Frost uh, movie. Uh, I think, is it on Netflix by any chance? Frost is on Mubi. There's a platform called Mubi. Uh, okay. Yeah. Yeah, I'll try it. Thank you so much. Yeah. Uh, my name is Justine Nantale. Uh, I come from Uganda originally, and I have lived here for 18 years now. And um, I work with Francesca occasionally uh, for the mother tongues. I'm more of a singer, a performer, a dancer. <laughs> so not into really public speaking. I like to express myself more than speaking. But it's such a privilege to be here. And I'm going to be sharing with you um, some of the books I'm reading. I'm not a big reader, and I think I can appeal to some people. <laughs> so I can recommend to easy reads um, for people that are not really into books. Um, I'm reading this book. I don't know if you can see it. Mm. It's, um, it's written by Sarah Croson. So she compiled a few um, poems uh, to uplift and to kind of like make people feel hopeful. Mm. So it's recent, it's not, uh, it's very new. It's a gift for Christmas. And I think everybody now has a few books lying around uh, from Christmas presents. So I have, uh, have read a few uh, poems in this, and there's a poem of kindness that I want to read to you, if that's okay. okay. Do Absolutely, you? thank you. Yeah, please do. Yeah, and then I have another book that is written um, 
in my mother tongue is called Luganda. So I'll, I'll focus on this <laughs> because I want to really recommend this to uh, my, my family, friends uh, living in Ireland, um, just to read to their children and just to uh, maybe open conversation about culture and the storytelling and everything. So in this book, so Kindness was written by Naomi Shihab. I don't know where she's from. I didn't do my research. But um, here it goes. Before you know what kindness really is, you must lose things. Feel the future dissolve in a moment, like salt in a weakened broth. What you held in your hand, what you counted and carefully saved, all this must go so you know how to desolate, uh, desolate the landscape that can be between the regions of kindness. How you ride, how you ride and ride, thinking the bus will never stop, the passengers eating maize and chicken will stare out of the window forever. Before you learn the tender gravity of kindness, you must travel where the Indian in a white poncho lies dead by the side of the road. You must see how this could be you, how he too was someone who journeyed through the night with plants and the simple breath that kept him alive. Before you know kindness as the deepest thing inside, you must know sorrow as the other deepest thing. You must wake up with the sorrow. You must speak to it till your voice catches the thread um, of all sorrows. And you see the size of the cloth. Then it is only kindness that makes sense anymore. Only kindness that ties your shoes and sends you out in the day to gaze at bread. Only kindness that raises its head from crowd of the world to say, it is I you have been looking for. And then goes with you everywhere like a shadow or a friend. I find this really um, interesting story to read, um, I mean, poem because it's kind of true. <laughs> you can't know kindness if you haven't been through a, a tough situation. Mm -hmm. And there's a lot of stories in this book. I really um, strongly recommend it. So you can get it in Isons or any bookstore. I don't know the author, so I'm not really making. <laughs> <laughs> well, and I think, you know, a, a book that is about uplifting and, and about hope and particularly something that is a, a collection of things that people can drop in and out of is yeah. maybe exactly what people might need uh, in after the time that we've had and coming into hopefully uh, a more uplifting and hopeful year. But that was a really beautiful poem. Thank you so much for sharing that with us. Yeah, it's, it's quite interesting. Yeah. So I have a few that I haven't read and um, I just read one at a time. I'm not a big reader. So this is really good for starters, for people who want to read, but they're not really interested. So, <laughs> so this is the book, um, it's quite interesting. So I'll go into this book, um, it's called Zinunula Omunaku. So it's written in my mother tongue, but I, um, it's very rich. The language is rich. I thought I was fluent in my mother tongue, but I'm not. <laughs> so there's this perception that, um, you know, people speak African or people speak one language. It's like English, English is com complex. Mm -hmm. Like you have to go to college to even study English and to do linguistic and all that. So it's same as uh, Luganda. So I would recommend it, but I would also recommend um, you read, there's a dictionary <laughs> at the back to mm -hmm. just explain some of the words that are used. Uh, there's a rich um, literature in my mother tongue Luganda, and this book is about uh, an orphan. So what I did, I went to get a summary of it because it's such a, an interesting book and I wouldn't do it justice because I haven't finished reading it. I remember uh, seeing a film before uh, when I was younger about it. It was set a long time ago before colonization and um, it just goes to show you the rich culture, you know, the Ugandan rich culture. So. I'm going to read you a story that I, well, a summary that I got from the Buganda website. So just briefly, Zinunula, um, Zinunula is a, an orphan. 
Okay, Zinula's father dies before Zinula is born. And his mother, about two years after he is born, he is raised by his grandparents. And this is a, a story that most African kids would relate to. So if there was a war or anything like that, most, most of the friends that I know, they would have the similar story. They would have grown up with their grandparents. Um, so his paternal uncle, a wealthy man with several wives and servants, takes him to his home after the death of his grandparents against his wish. So usually in all families in Ireland or anywhere, really, there's always a rich uncle <laughs> or a rich auntie, um, but usually a rich uncle with servants okay. and all that. I haven't found I haven't found my rich uncle yet. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I'm sure he's there. You have to look at it. Yeah. <laughs> so where was I? So against his wish, he becomes uh, the darling of one of the uncle's wives and her daughter, Komunaku, but other wives hate his guts. So the uncle has lots of wives as it is. He's a rich uncle. The head wife plots to kill him and a servant, Mikolo, whom he had befriended. Komunaku tips them off and they decide to run away. They experience many wild adventures. So the wild adventures is what's most interesting in this book because um, they get to play games. These are all traditional games. So it's explained in the books. They play the African chess. Um, the, the other wild um, adventures were, you know, fighting with animals, um, like lions and all these uh, big fights. So, yeah, so they experienced many wild adventures on uh, ensuing gen journeys. So they eventually settled in another land with new strange customs. So they go into another land that they have a different custom, same as when you come to Ireland, <laughs> everything is different and you have to settle in there. So he also experiences more um, different customs. So killing lions and other fierce animals and taming and clipping the wings of bullies. Um, so there's a lot of stories to this, um, to this boys. Yeah, there's a, a love story as well. He falls in love with the king's daughter. <laughs> I think that sounds familiar in the Western world. Um, yeah. So anyway, I would really recommend this to read it to your children if you're a Ugandan family. But also, I think there's a bit, there's translations for the book and films that we can watch. I can try to find them. Maybe next time I'll put them under the comments there. Mm -hmm. Great, that uh, would be great, thank you. Yeah, it's quite interesting. I need to go into it deeper to mm -hmm. actually explain it, but um, so far I'm enjoying it. And that's all I have for you. For that's now. brilliant. And I think um, so far I'm enjoying it, honestly, is probably the best recommendation you can give for a book. If it's something that is, whether it's something that is maybe taking you out of yourself and you can kind of escape to a, a, a different, you know, atmosphere as you read it, or whether it's something that brings you closer to yourself, if you're enjoying it, it that in and of itself has huge power. Um, thank you so much for sharing uh, those those with us. And if you can find the links and want to put them in the in the comments, um, that would be great for for people to follow up with. Um, so last but by no means least, Tatiana, uh, thank you for joining us. Thank you. Can you hear me? Yes. Yeah. Yeah. Thank you. Uh, pleasure to be here. Uh, it's, it's interesting uh, that how, uh, uh, how everyone here kind of connects themselves with their somewhere that's not Ireland um, using books or movies or films. So the power of literature, the power of art to bring us home, let's put it mm -hmm. like that. So I also brought a book uh, so Clarice Lispector is a she actually an Ukrainian author, but she moved to Brazil when she was two years old. So I'm originally from Brazil. And to be honest, this is not the book I'm reading at the moment, but this is the one that touched my heart when I got the invite. You know, I really wanted to share this with you. And this um, book is about a young girl that she moves to Rio de Janeiro. Uh, and this is a common 
story uh, in Brazil. So uh, most of people, they go to the south or to the southeast in, uh, to, to find more uh, opportunities. And somehow she arrives in Rio de Janeiro. And I think it's more about becoming invisible when you move somewhere else and then you were looking for opportunities and it seems that that's not the place for you. So this is actually the feeling that I got from this book. I don't want to tell you the, the whole story because I really want people to read it. I was very surprised when I found this in a bookshop here in Dublin because it's a masterpiece in our literature and it was just on a window waving, like I really want to read in, in English. And I also noticed, of course, that as I assume in every language, uh, some, some things are lost in translation. So for instance, uh, this author, um, she kind of, she, she, she describes very well accents and textures and places and especially accents. How can you translate an accent? You know, I find very hard, but it's very interesting. And there is some parts that I will put in like a comic relief, but we, you know, when, when you think like how it could be comic if it was not tragic. Mm -hmm. So the, the, the kind of thought that I have in mind. So yes, so our of the star. Um, and about, okay, I'm very happy that Jijo brought loads of movies, recommendations and documentaries, you know? <laughs> Because I got stuck, <laughs> and I think, <laughs> I think mainly because I watch pretty much everything, like from cartoons to reality shows, and you know, like everything, everything. But one thing that I watched recently, and I think is still that is stuck with me, you know, that is still with me at the moment, is uh, Don't Look Up. Mm -hmm. I don't know if you yeah. watch it. Yeah, I haven't so, yet, but it's on my it's on my my ever growing list. Oh, it's it's always ever growing, isn't it? <laughs> <laughs> it's that uh, DiCaprio movie, is it? Mm -hmm. Yes. Oh, okay. Yes. So the comet is approaching uh, the planet, and there is uh, a part of population and led by politicians. They are in denial, and well. I can say the rest is history because it's so relatable, you know, and to many contexts. And again, there is a comic relief. There are some parts that, you know, you want to laugh, but when you think twice, this is actually happening, right? Mm -hmm. So the comet is approaching and the scientists are trying to tell, they're going on the tour, trying to tell people that, uh, you know, the, the earth is about to disappear and people don't really want to, to hear. Some people don't really want to hear. Some people want to hear, but then what can we do? Is there something to be done? And I think we can apply that in so many contexts around the globe that I couldn't even mention. Yeah, so for those who haven't watched it yet, that's my recommendation. I think um, the past couple of years have really taught us, both with the COVID pandemic, but also with the environmental crisis, the climate crisis, that, you know, you see films like that or like um, zombie movies or apocalypse movies where there's always some people who are resolutely ignoring what's happening or not believing or and not trusting or whatever it happens to be. And it seem, seemed previously to this somewhat unbelievable. Surely if there was a comet approaching Earth, we would all know and we would all believe and we trust the science. But I suppose these, the, 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 it's that kind of idea of art imitating life or life imitating art. The past while has taught us that not everybody will um, maybe believe in or trust the science and everybody you know there are as many opinions as there are people on on the planet so uh, that is while I haven't watched that film I've certainly seen a uh, commentary on it and, and what you're saying there chimes with that that you know there's always something uh, or somebody who's going to disagree even though it might seem uh, unbelievable but I suppose that is the nature of living in 
uh, on earth and, and, and in a, a vast society. Yeah, 100%. And also, uh, um, sorry, I didn't introduce myself properly, but uh, I am a conflict resolution professional. And mm -hmm. so I'm with Mother Tongues and I'm also a, a dancer. And for me, I've, I've been finding very hard to bring people to engage. Mm. You know? So in my context, and uh, I do a lot of anti-racism work, you know, and I don't know if you all heard about a term called odierism, that people are watching the TVs and it's old, like odier, and then mm -hmm. somebody talk like odierism that everybody's on the screen telling, oh dear, oh dear, oh dear, but there's so little action. Mm. At the end of the movie, I just burst in tears. I'm like, oh my oh. God, you know? <laughs> this is happening. Mm. Yeah. And that, that move from, from uh, oh dear to action and how, how we make that happen. I suppose in some ways that's where art, like you were saying, there's a, there's a, a power in art and in literature and in festivals and things to maybe move people from saying oh dear to connecting to their emotional self and pushing them to move through that to, to action. Um, I think there's a there's a lot of work to be done to engage in uh, to, to move people from excuse me oh <coughs> gosh excuse me from oh dear to action but it's definitely important work to be done. Um, thank you all very much for joining me uh, and for joining us. We've lost Francesca, who's, as she said, four, four weeks out from a festival, so has plenty of work to be doing. Um, but on behalf of ourselves in Access, the Dublin City Libraries, and I, I know from Mother Tongues, thank you very much for, for joining us. Um, the Mother Tongues Festival, as Francesca said, is the programme is live. You can get it on the website. Um, and the Access Ballymun Dublin City Libraries project Belong Beyond is still running. We have another week of content to go out. Um, and I'm going to give us a, a slight plug for something that's happening this evening, which is um, the premiere of a short poetry film commissioned by Access as part of the, the Dublin City Libraries and Access Ballymun project Belong Beyond. And this is called The Story of a City. So Roxana Nikliam and uh, filmmaker Cahal Machenbaha have created a really beautiful uh, film. Um, Roxana has written and performed it and Cahal has recorded it and it really celebrates libraries, it celebrates archives and it celebrates Dublin City. So that will be uh, going live today at 4 p.m. on the Access Volume 1 YouTube. Um, and we'd uh, invite you all to, to look at that and, and to join us for that premiere. It will be staying up on YouTube and you'll be able to find it there at the end of your workday if you can't take the five minutes. Um, but we would recommend you if you can make a cup of tea and sit down for a five minute break at four o'clock. It's a, it's a real treat. Um, so thank you very much to uh, Tatiana, to Justine and to Gijo for joining us. Um, and for all of those recommendations, the list is ever growing, but it's getting more varied and more vast and more interesting by the week. So thank you very much. Um, and to all those uh, watching and listening, we will be having another Culture Circle next week, next Thursday, same time, same place. So